Hi, I'm Meg Schwamm. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Academia Sica in Taiwan, and today I've gathered a bunch of Kuiper experts, a cosmologist, um, other planetary scientists, and friends to sort of talk about the New Horizons uh, latest result that just came out at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. So you might have been with us on our Hangout uh, on Monday where we had some predictions of what we thought we were going to see with uh, the New Horizons encounter. Um, and, you know, we now have some more exciting images. And, of course, as I think everyone now knows, the New Horizons spacecraft did safely uh, pass through the Pluto system, phoned home, and sent some data. <laughs> and some happy cheers from people who would like to get the data in a few years when it becomes yeah. not proprietary. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and we'll get right into it, because um, I think we'll um, have a lot to say. So I'll just call everybody out as we go through, and you can sort of just reintroduce yourself. So we'll start with on my left, um, Amy. Do you want to say hello? Yeah. Hi, my name is Amy Bar Molinar. I'm a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute in Tucson, Arizona. Um, I work on the formation and the interior evolution of icy bodies. Fantastic. How about you, Erin? Um, hi, I'm Erin Ryan. I'm at University of Maryland and Goddard Space Flight Center, and I mostly work on asteroids and comets. Great. How about you, Katie? Uh, so I'm um, I'm Katie Mack. I am a cosmologist. Uh, I do things like dark matter theory, and um, I am a fan of solar system science uh, without being anything like an expert. Um, so I'm. I'm really excited to hear what you all are having to say about this. Fantastic. And Kevin? Hi, Kevin Walsh. I work at Southwest Research Institute, which is a very quiet and empty building right now, as all of my colleagues are at Johns Hopkins, uh, attending all the Pluto events. I study solar system formation, evolution, and dynamics. Fantastic. And Luke? Luke, you're muted. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, hi. Uh, yeah, Luke Downs also at uh, Swery. Uh, I just saw Kevin in real life, which was great. We <laughs> just see each other on Google Hangouts, and uh, I work on planetary rings and solar system dynamics. Great, and Meg. Um, hi, uh, my name is Meg Rosenberg, and I am a planetary scientist turned science communicator. So I have a foot in both worlds, uh, but my background is in impact cratering. Fantastic. And Michelle? Um, I'm Michelle Bannister. I'm a postdoc at uh, the National Research Council's Hertzberg Institute, and I work on discovery of new objects in the outer solar system. And Wes? Uh, hi, I'm Wes Fraser, also a postdoc at the uh, Hertzberg Institute for Astrophysics, and I study the surfaces of the small bodies that are a bit smaller than Pluto. Very cool. <laughs> So I guess, um, you know, today has been sort of a big day, and as well as yesterday, um, I think a little bit anticlimactic until we started seeing some data back, um, you know, because all we saw was, you know, sort of a countdown to um, uh, New Horizons coming closest, closest approach to the Pluto system. I don't know if anyone else was nervous, but I was nervous till we got that uh, signal back saying that the spacecraft was half, was nominal, was very healthy and happy and had data stored on it. Um, yeah, it didn't get us back a dust. Awesome. Um, and I guess it reminds you, I made breakfast while the signal was traveling through the inner, to, through past Jupiter into the inner solar system. So, uh, I mean, just to give you some scale, that's, you know, it's four and a half hours from that signal to um, go from uh, 30 AU all the way back to Earth. So we did get, there was data that was sent back. Um, I think we should also congratulate the New Horizons team. Um, Alan Stern and everybody who's been involved, as well as the you know all the engineers who made this possible. So maybe a round of applause for them um, for that. And I'm sure they're they're anxiously looking at their data and uh, hopefully celebrating as well um, the new results. Um, so I guess we um, hopefully this is showing up on everybody's screen. Um, but this is the the image we had you know before you know a few days ago, um, and now what we have. Um, we'll get to the very high resolution one, but the one that came in yesterday um, is the one I'm going to try to bring up now, which is this one. Um, and hopefully that's now showing on the screen. So there's the heart in it. it's uh, pure form. Um, that's been named for uh, um, 
Clyde Tomba, or it's 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 a, in informally named for for Clyde Tomba. So hopefully that will become a permanent um, permanent name for that feature. Um, there's been some speculation about what the heart actually is. Um, Wes, you know, what do you see when you sort of saw all these kind of features there? Um, was uh, were you expecting uh, it, that kind of stuff? Around, uh, uh, it was really interesting to see such a small region and very sharply bordered by stuff that appears to not be smooth. Whether it's actually not smooth or just uh, little dark streaks and this sort of thing, I have absolutely no idea because, of course, we can't see the high-resolution images yet. But it was just like, the, the sharp border between the edges of the heart and everything else around attention the most. Right. So I think you're breaking up just a bit, or at least for me. Um, so we'll get back oh. to you in one second. Okay, I'm going to um, try to back again in a sec, sorry. Cool. Um, what about um, for you, Luke? Uh, I mean, I, you know, I mean, there's definitely looks like there's sort of structure on the right-hand side. I don't know if that's raised or not. Um, what, you, what was your impression of this image that was taken uh, right before, close to close to surprise? Well, I guess my, you know, I'm... I'm no geologist or geophysicist, but you know my impression was, wow, this really doesn't look like anything um, we'd seen before. You know, people were talking a lot about Triton being the best analog, but from the from the you know contrast that we knew of from HST and from the mutual events, I kind of thought it might look like Iapetus. You know, even a couple weeks ago there was some loose talk that, oh, maybe I see a ridge on there, so maybe it really is like a Iapetus, but it just looks like its own, you know, special peachy, peachy keen world. Right, and to give some context, that's the Triton that we just pulled up, so the cantaloupe terrain, all the sort of bumps and wiggles, they really fully sort of show, at least in the image, the, the global image. Um, as, you know, as Amy's pointed out, you know, um, Triton's got Neptune to, you know, flex it, and it's not obvious that uh, that Pluto is anything that can cause it to, uh, that can stress it in the same way, so. Yeah. Amy, what did, what did you sort of see when you saw this in the Well, when I saw this, the first thing that I thought is that it seems to me that a little bit of atmosphere goes a long way. Um, you know, Pluto looks to me like a body that's had a, a lot of interaction with an atmosphere. And I know that the atmosphere is very thin, but, you know, I, I've heard people joking that it looks like Mars. I know that everyone in the planetary community is tearing their hair out when I say that. But it does look like there's been some kind of transport, streaking. I, I don't know. I don't know what that means, but um, it is really interesting to me that um, this does look like a body that has an atmosphere, and Pluto does, in fact, have an atmosphere, even if it's very thin. Yeah, there's definitely active processes on it. Um, I think I was a little surprised by how smooth it was. Um, I assumed it was some kind of frost-y thing. Maybe it was fresher methane. Um, so I was definitely surprised. I think I went to bed at that point, but um, Chris Lintot <laughs> and this guy, I don't know what I was doing at that point, but Chris Lintot and this guy at night has these really, they had these really nice like summary videos, so I watched that and he was saying like the heart got broken too. And I found the, uh, the scaled, uh, the false color image, so that where, um, so I'm seeing if I can pull that up. Um, so this is what I pulled off the NASA website. Um, that when you sort of, I mean again, these are color, but a lot of it, you know, this is not the highest resolution data. So unfortunately with New Horizons, that, you know, long distance away from the Earth kills you in the sense that it's going to take a year to, or actually 16 months to get all of the data at the highest resolution. So they're, you know, back to, to Earth. So they're, you know, they've got a sort of low res version of the, the images they're going to get and spectra and other things are coming later. Um, so that you know, there's more. I, it's, as someone said it's it's like Christmas every day or a birthday every day because you'll get some new data sent back. Um, but when you see this sort of false color, you're sort of stretching to sort of see composition. And um, you know, maybe Wes, you um, this is for Wes and Michelle. You know, to me, the heart sort of splits into two, right? You sort of see it. It sort of changes into into you know maybe two different materials, which I didn't expect. It's really no, quite me, hard to yeah. know. Oh, go ahead, Michelle. 
Now, to me, this is one of the most fascinating things about this hut is, so first it's location on the equator, which, you know, if it's an icy material, is particularly unexpected, given that would be um, one of the hottest regions of the of the whole world, so you'd expect it to be under severe thermal stress and would be um, trying to evaporate as quickly as possible. But to have two, like, it looks like the, um, if you look look at this uh, um, false color image where, you know, one uh, infrared wavelength has been mapped to one visual color and another to a different visual color, so we have that greenish left and the more turquoise bluey right of the heart. Um, the right of the heart has this much more fretted, pitted, one might say, uh, you know, sublimed uh, texture to it. And it's interesting that that bluish um, actually propagates all the way across the right of the hemisphere uh, towards where you have that very hummocky terrain, which has much larger, blotchier circles to it, and which you can see has some relief as it goes right around the edge of the uh, of the limb of Pluto there. Yeah. And um, then there's the uh, potential name, which is this contiguous region, and that's that seems very very distinct. So this yeah, there's something very fascinating compositionally going on there. Right. So you can get some hints from the if you look at the color of Sharon. Um, there is a similarly blue section on Sharon, and we we can pretty mm -hmm. safely assume, I would think, that it's not methane on Sharon because it's just too small. Um, and there's not much transfer going on between the two. Uh, what I what I speculate is that the yellow section that you see on Pluto, the left side of the heart, if you want to call it that, is uh, a receding methane section, and the the blue section is a lower albedo, maybe water ice rich thing, because of course that's what you see in the spectrum of Sharon. Yeah. Um, and so it would be interesting to see these two icy sections here, just with one that still has methane on it and one without. Yeah, and I think it proves the point. Or whatever. And it proves the point that like it's not just the images we want the spectra, which is going to tell us. Oh yeah. Um, and I heard rumors that something like the carbon monoxide measurements from Earth might coincide with that one of the parts of the heart. Um, but again, that's all sort of rumor going around via you know Twitter and other things. Um, so I think that's going to be really exciting is when we get both those things together. Um, I think, you know, it'd be interesting, you know, we have some asteroid people here. So um, also joining us is Andy Rifkin. Um, so Andy, because I'm going to uh, pass to you. What do you, you know, what do you see when you, you see these two worlds? All right. First, we have to see where the mute button is. Um, <laughs> um, well, um, well, they don't look like the kind of stuff we see at Two and a half AU, uh, that's for sure. Um, you know, the, uh, the as, as was mentioned at the press conference, you know, there are, there's that section of Pluto that has no craters that's very young. I don't think we would, you know, that, that's something that you don't expect to see anywhere in the inner solar system. Uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. There are planets in the inner solar system, I guess. Anywhere in the asteroid belt. I keep forgetting about actual planets. Um, these are clearly, uh, you know, dynamic worlds on which uh, lots of things happen. Um, the the atmospheric cycle on on Pluto um, it clearly has a major. Uh, effect on its surface, and that's uh, not something we're used to seeing, um, again, on, on the, the small bodies of the uh, inner solar system. Um, I'm careful, I should be careful, because uh, Aaron's there, and a lot of, when I, when I think about small bodies, I think about asteroids, and comets do have a, a lot of the kind of sublimation um, kinds of uh, processes uh, that we're that we're seeing here, so it's all. Um, and I think there's a series thing that's about to come up from. Yeah. Yeah. Because you've been talking a lot about cratering. I mean, this is the image sort of of the dwarf planet in the inner solar system, right? And it looks. This is kind of what I expected Sharon to look like. Um, like what? Bit, well, <laughs> a little bit more, you know, whitish and icy, but like cratered. <laughs> what did you just call me? <laughs> I, that's what I'm seeing. I'm not seeing series. I'm seeing a headshot of Wes right now. So that's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
that I'm I don't know how to do. All right. Um, but yeah, series is uh, is the thing in the asteroid belt that we, we were we would expect to most look like uh, Pluto and Charon, um, and I think we have. Um, the, and the, the bright spots on series, which now uh, at least Chris Russell is backing away from interpreting as ice and is thinking maybe more like it's a... Uh, he's, he's talked about salt. Um, again, shows that even you can have these these larger bodies that we think are ice-rich, that we think have these, these icy natures, um, and depending on where in the solar system they are, they're just going to react very differently to the to the conditions they're in. So you could take Europa and put it, you know, rip it out of Jupiter's uh, embrace and, and, you know, put it at two and a half AU, and after a few billion years, it's maybe going to look like Ceres. Maybe if you take Europa and you put it out at 40 AU, um, it's going to evolve to look something more like Pluto. So there, there's clearly, to, to me, as, as a an asteroid fan, uh, the, the kind of continuum of, of the small bodies and how they all interrelate with each other uh, is really is really interesting. You know, how do these 40-kilometer bodies like Hydra, and, and you know, I'm, I'm, we'll, we'll get a better look at Hydra and better look at the small satellites, how do those change um, when they're orbiting a, a, a body like Pluto versus free-flying in the Kuiper Belt versus orbiting something like Jupiter or something like Saturn or, or be in the asteroid belt. So there's, there's a lot of uh, opportunity for comparison among all these, these things that, that really hopefully will let us get at some of the, the processes that are, that are external to them, so to speak. Did that make any sense? It's been a crazy few days here at APL, so... <laughs> <laughs> It did, um, and I mean, I think is, and you were, you know, you were there, right? So you were, you were watching sort of the reactions from everybody. Um, so um, I, I guess, um, you know, something I have for for Aaron is, you know, what, you know, there has been some. I mean, I know this was, it was probably, I think it was Bill McKinnon, right, suggested that maybe um, a dwarf planet could have been from the asteroid belt could have been sort of put into the the Kuiper belt. Does the new know, data, you think? I know you're Aaron, but I'm going to listen to you. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Aaron, I think you're muted. Oh, yeah. So I didn't get the end of the question. Something about yeah. I mean, about there's been I mean, there's been the, <laughs> there was a paper and there was a theory that maybe you could take a you know a large dwarf planet from the asteroid belt and could it have moseyed its way into the Kuiper belt? Um, you know. Do you think the uh, do you think the data today sort of you know and the data of the past few days from Pluto and Sharon kind of put that out of context and you know as well as what what do you feel like when you as Andy was saying like the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt are they really now two very sort of different sort of populations that don't really mix? Um, you know, I kind of feel like that's sort of the weird question that we all still want to answer, right? Like there's this whole section of the asteroid belt where we, we don't necessarily know what's going on, like the Hildas, the Trojans, you know, everything, you're just looking at this very thin layer on the surface, but you don't know what's underneath it. So it, it's very probable if we took those things and put them out, they might look like Pluto. Um, we'll find out. I mean, there's lots of other observations people are doing. Um, you know, lots of things with, like, light curves even, just trying to look for binary systems in the Trojans to see if we can get densities, to see if we can get these sort of low-density, funky things. Um, so, you know, I'm definitely leaning on the case of more data. I want more data. <laughs> but um, I, I think, actually, um, Pluto's kind of cool for the, the comet perspective because now just seeing, like, all this weird schmutz, like, not evenly distributed even on something that's relatively spherical and is far out there is actually sort of interesting for us because, you know, you get comet people where you just sort of uh, do some observations and suddenly you see a spike in something and it's just like, oh, we must have hit the right pocket on the comet. Um, so kind of seeing an uneven distribution all over Pluto is kind of cool. Yeah, I'm... Uh... You know, people who have the uh, Nice model on their on their Hangout bingo cards can be ready here. So, when you know, when when Luke and I were your age, um, you know, the thought was that 
right, was that the asteroids were rocky, and then there's the low albedo asteroids. We're going to ignore them because we're just going to ignore them because it's 1985, and that's what we're going to do. And then there's icy stuff and everything accreted where it where it is now. And so there really was a difference between stuff that accreted at 3 AU and stuff that accreted at 40 AU, and you're done. And now with um, stuff like the Nice model, uh, the Grand TAC, um, the idea that, that there was potentially real large-scale migration of material, um, it, it leads to the possibility that maybe there was more of a compositional gradient and stuff can be in very different places from where it started, and uh, that adds a a layer of complexity to things. Uh, so whether, uh, like Aaron said, whether the, the Trojans and the Hildas are really, you know, immigrant immigrant cousins to the to the KBOs uh, is is a really interesting question that that uh, we're on the cusp of cusp of getting to. Um, can I just ask? Um, so I think I know what the Trojan asteroids are. What are the Hildas, and how do these relate to the KBOs? Oh, okay, so, um, so I'm the Hilda person. Um, so the Hildas are actually at 4 AU, so they're in a 3 to 2 resonance with Jupiter. Um, and if you look down sort of uh, on the solar system from the, the North Pole on a snapshot, they kind of make a, a triangle. So there's kind of a corner at L4, a corner at L5, and a corner at L3. And basically the way that you can sort of make this funky triangle shape is you have Jupiter migrate inwards by about half an AU. So, of course, with the various dynamical models, the question has been, where did they come from? Did they come from just beyond Saturn, or did they come from, like, way out towards the Kuiper belt? So we've been doing um, color surveys um, with uh, telescopes at Kapik to try and get colors for a large sample of Hilda asteroids and right now, if we kind of compare them to the Kuiper Belt things, they look like the sort of blue population in the Kuiper Belt. But that's not necessarily the most diagnostic. The problem is we have no spectral features that we can really, you know, tie things together with. So Do they match the same colors of, or do they have the same colors as the Trojans? Um, yeah. So we are leaning towards a higher proportion of D type in the Hildas than the Trojans um, in our sample right now. But, um, Andy, don't you have a Trojan color survey that you're doing? <laughs> I do. <laughs> do. We need to compare <laughs> notes. <laughs> yeah, I have, to, I have to get the data reduced first. So uh, TBD. But, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, TBD. Um, but, yes, I've, I've got a Trojan uh, color survey, as, as Aaron said, that's, that's taken me to to do some observing in South Africa and, and uh, some in Arizona, so I've got uh, you know have to have to clear it's 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 one you know the science life it's one thing after another so gotta <laughs> yep. yes and I and I think the point of this diversion is just to kind of show that like the you know the small body populations we're still trying to understand them and you know we really are getting our first close up picture of a large you know large Pluto sized body or dwarf planet in, in the outer solar system, and there's several of these objects, and there, there's lots, as many smaller objects, and so, you know, understanding Pluto is going to help us understand that picture as well as help us understand the rest of the, the solar system, hopefully. Um, and I guess we should get straight into sort of the data that came out today. Um, New Horizons turned back towards Earth later, or I guess earlier today, sent back a couple um, sort of high-priority data. And uh, Kevin, I think you got your wish. You got some images. They sent back um, some data on Hydra. So, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I can pull up the the image. Yeah, Hydra looks cool. There is no doubt about it. Um, it's going to be real interesting to see. They, I think, Hal Weaver, or I think he said that they'll get three to four times better resolution. Someone can correct me if I'm totally wrong there. But we're going to see Hydra even better, which is great, because these brightness variations are look really dramatic. So it's going to be interesting to see how much of this is morphology, how much of this is albedo, uh, or just brightness variations across the surface. But already, already in a highly regular shape is is staring at us, and I think they said it was already very reflective, which is really important because it helps us constrain, um, helps us understand the masses of the small satellites in the system and understand the dynamics in the system much better. Um, but I, I believe that. It had been, uh, sorry, go ahead, Meg. 
And just to take a step back, right, it's thought that potentially Hydra probably came as, and all the other little satellites came off in some kind of collision, um, that Pluto had some kind of collision, that these are sort of ice chips chunked off, right? So it's not, so for me, it wasn't so surprising that it was, um, the thought is that it's wa probably water ice based on the, the albedo and the reflectiveness. Was that surprising to you in terms of the shape, or, I'm you know, you'd expect it to be some weird shape thing? Uh, I didn't know what to expect out of the shape. I I think that the system that we're seeing is the last of many generations of small satellite systems, which would suggest that the little guys have been destroyed and then re-accreted again and again. And that would probably push me towards thinking that they would have been a little bit more regularly shaped if they had kind of reaccumulated from a, a disk or a ring. So getting a such an extremely irregular shape uh, is a little surprising and, and pretty cool. It might challenge that idea that that these guys had reaccumulated from a ring. It, it might suggest that this is really potentially one huge collisional shard, which would be totally surprising. And is Hydra, out of all the small satellites, which, do you know the order and size again? Is Hydra's largest or second largest after Sharon? Uh, Nix and Hydra are very close. I'm not sure if we know which one for sure is bigger. bigger. Uh, uh, and I certainly think that we'll find out after that. Um, and maybe someone can correct me if they know for sure. I had the masses of them, or the projected masses, taped up somewhere in my office, but that seems to be have gone missing. And will definitely be invalid after this anyway. Uh, so Nix and Hydra are similar in size. One is at the 4-to-1 uh, resonance, and one is at the 6-to-1. I believe Hydra is the outermost one. So it's the furthest one that we see. Right. Um, do you know, I guess from the shape, do you guess, like, there was suggestion that the, uh, sort of the satellites were tumbling. I guess if this looks so regular, it's not so surprising that it might be tumbling around, which is why they thought the light curve might be indicating that. Does right, that I think we right up to what, yeah, I think this would be precisely what Mark Showalter was getting at when he was trying to analyze the light curves of the satellites and predicting that there was some chaotic spin states that would really demand irregular shapes, and uh, that's what we're seeing. Um, I, I have a question. So, so is the is the Kuiper belt just too uh, diffuse for these things to be like captured objects that were just like little bodies that that happened to be in the neighborhood? Or I mean, because like you know, um, Phobos and Deimos are captured asteroids uh, for Mars, right? Like, is it is it just that there are too few of them, and, or, or they're too far away to to come in and do that, or what's why do uh, why do they have to be collisional things? We should be careful on both counts there. Phobos and Deimos uh, and these small satellites at Pluto suffer the same problem in that they are totally coplanar. There's zero inclination, essentially zero, less than one degree inclination. So you can't randomly capture objects and have them be all in the same plane. There's, there's probabilities there's... by that. So Pluto or so Phobos and Deimos maybe capture played a role in getting the material into the system, but it would be nearly impossible to capture two satellites and have them end up being in the same plane. And here... Yeah, I have no here. idea about that. I, I, w I, thought that. I thought that that was like just this thing that was true about those moons. And there's, cool. there's serious, uh, you know, serious issues with capturing Phobos and Deimos also, right? Isn't the, the fact that Phobos is going in and Deimos is going out means that, right, at some at some point earlier in their history they were much closer and there's some issue with that and... So Absolutely. And the captured object, the captured the object is very high oh, eccentricity well. and so they would have been crossing earlier in their history. Um, but, but that's Phobos and Debos. Your general <laughs> system rule of thumb is... <laughs> a lot of the the dynamic dynamic is natural. If it's highly inclined or or going around the opposite way to all the other satellites, the, the rotation of the planet or the uh, main body of the system, then it's been captured. That's your general how you're working all this up. Yeah, the dynamical principles apply here that while you can capture some material into the system, you definitely can't capture them onto these orbits uh, as a system. But the people that have studied carefully how to capture material into the system from close flybys and so on, failed to capture enough material to build the small satellites. So it's really thought that they came from Pluto and Charon at some point in their history. But it's hard, 
it, there's, there's a huge number of problems in doing that that we don't understand and we're hoping that this mission helps us with. Um, you can't just hit Pluto or Sharon today and trivially form a disk around the two of them from which you build the satellites. That's really hard to do. And likewise, if, if this debris was thrown off of Pluto when Sharon impacted Pluto in the Sharon forming event, uh, the simulations that have modeled this, they, they leave the debris really close to, to the Pluto-Sharon orbit. And then Sharon tidally evolves and either eats it all up or spits it out of the system. Um, so there's a lot of difficulties there. None of those, they, we haven't even mentioned the fact that they seem to be lined up in, in orbital resonances with each other. So they're a disaster. Uh, and they're really hard to understand, um, which is why they're so cool. And I think it's worth putting the point. So I put up the plot of the known Kuiper Belt objects. So this is from the Minor Planet Center as of today. There are, you know, 1,500 known objects, but they cover a wide, like, it's a large volume that, you know, it's very unlikely in now that there's a collision going on. Um, uh, just too much space. Um, and I think, Amy, you sort of agree on that, right? That, I mean, even for the object, one object that we do know, I guess we have two. We have Pluto, and we also have, you know, um, Haumea that had a, a mantle-shattering impact, you know, it's very unlikely that that happened in the scattered disk of the Kuiper Belt. So is that true that, again, this, you know, it's very unlikely that these kind of massive collisions happen very, very frequently in, in the Kuiper Belt, or as of the Kuiper Belt today? I don't know what to think <laughs> after what we've seen today. I, I, I literally don't know what to think. Um, I think that, you know, you're right based on um, how sparse the Kuiper Belt is today, um, at least you know, based on what we've seen with telescopes, um, it doesn't really make sense that these things should be hitting each other, and it you know it doesn't really make sense that they should be hitting each other recently. But I I don't know. I mean, first of all, it seems that a lot of the big objects in the Kuiper Belt have been hit, and from what Kevin was saying, you know, it got me thinking about whether maybe they might have been hit more than once by large bodies. Um, I mean, I think we, you know, we kind of saw that by the presence of all of these moons um, around these other Kuiper Belt objects. I, I don't really know, you know, like you guys were saying earlier, I don't really know any way of forming these small moons other than in a collision. And it has to be, you know, a pretty big collision. You have to get a decent amount of material off to make these moons. So, um, I mean, it could be that we just really you know, we just really don't understand the collisional history of, of the Kuiper Belt, um, you know, despite all of our models. Uh, I don't know how much further you want me to go, <laughs> but, um, you know, the fact that the, there are so few impact craters on both Pluto and Charon is, is really suggestive to me that, you know, there's been some kind of very energetic event that's happened in the system, and you know, one logical suggestion is that, you know, maybe the impact was very young. I mean, you know, I, I, it didn't happen very long ago. And I noticed that um, in the press conference today that, you know, the team were, you know, they didn't, they didn't want to go there. <laughs> you know, nobody wanted to say that. And I think it was Emily Lochtewala who was like, you know, look, I think the collision, you know, was relatively recent. Yep, um, and, you know, yeah, and that's a pretty big matzo ball out there. You know, you don't want to say that and then be proven wrong by data that comes along later, because it does really raise a lot of questions about the dynamical evolution of the whole solar system, not just the Kuiper Belt. Like, how do you know? How do these things get so stirred that they're hitting each other all the time? I mean, right, that's, right, that's really serious. So here's the the you know the the image. I think this is the image. If you saw the Alan Stern like mouth drop image. This is what the he was, I believe, looking at. So this is the highest resolution image of Sharon that we have. And uh, Sharon, I think everybody, I remember at least being told in grad school, like Sharon was going to get us the like cratering record because like this should have been the like pristine, doesn't have like it's just got some water ice. It should have been quiet. It got smacked into Pluto's going to have ge you know geology and atmosphere. That this is going to be the thing that we're going to study and do cratering and get the size distribution for the Kuiper Belt, and it doesn't really look like it has craters, <laughs> which means there's some kind of poly surfacing going on. Um, and I think but that it, was one of the it's things too that small. was pretty crazy. Right. And uh, mm -hmm. it's actually one of the questions, so maybe, Michelle, you want to take that, was, uh, so 
somebody was, uh, we have a couple people asking, what are the reasons why Sharon doesn't have an atmosphere but Pluto does? It's just too small. The, you're just, the atmosphere is just not going to be able to remain held in place around uh, the world. So, um, so Pluto is so, big enough to hold on to that density of atmosphere. So can I just check, um, if, if the surface were not, um, we're not young, then this then this would look a lot more like Ceres and just be completely pock, pockmarked with craters all over it. And so the fact that like we can see craters, but there are very few of them, um, it has to be resurfacing itself in some weird way. Is that is that correct? Yeah, for sure. That's uh, when people are saying activity at that point. That's what that's the term people are uh, implying. They're not there's no implication necessarily of the word volcano shouldn't be mentioned at this point, is my opinion. Um, yes, this is, please stop using cryovolcanism. Yeah, there, no, there is no evidence in this image from this resolution of image for me to make that statement. It's, this is a world that is active in some way and that any craters that have uh, formed of, especially the lower half of uh, Sharon uh, visible there, Something is erasing the cratering record there. So that's an active surface. Right. And it Anything could, else to figure out? And it, I mean, it, and also, it, you know, that means there's something flowing on the surface that d doesn't quite mean how. And they haven't identified a uh, cryovolcano. So I, that was, I think, one of the things I was a little, uh, sort of. Be careful. We don't, we don't have the high resolution data yet. that so you would, know, would right. want to say statements like flow. It could right. be tremors, right? right? Tremors can shake uh, craters to pieces just the same as rain can wash them away. That's a so very good we point. Don't, we don't actually know what's going on here. And I would actually argue that it, it may not be a flow thing. Just the fact that this lower bit down here is the only thing that seems to be washed away. And up here, there is a, but a bunch of rougher stuff. Granted, still no craters, but a, a very much a different surface. I don't, I don't think it's a, an atmospheric thing or a cryovolcanismic-like thing, uh, because it, to me, that would be a global process. You'd see that everywhere. Uh, or you'd, you sh I would expect you'd see the effects of that everywhere, not on half of it or a third of it or whatever this image actually applies. I think it's something else. So right. a, a, a but, dumb question. Um, do we know if this is where the Pluto facing hemisphere is this not is this the Pluto facing not Pluto facing where the sub Pluto point is? I mean I don't know how much Sharon how much Pluto could screen one of the hemispheres of Sharon um, or not. Um, I mean, I assume it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't get rid of all on, the craters. But. My fight was on the anti-Sharon side of Pluto, which means this space to me would also would be the Pluto-facing side of Sharon. I think I got that right. Yeah, and I, I think some of the sort of things that I, I was hearing yesterday was that maybe the dark spot on the top might be sort of a, like bit particles of methane that have escaped or not, uh, that have escaped onto. Sharon, which you might expect there to be some exchange, and it's, you know, darkened, is, again, the sort of darkened bits you see on Pluto, that maybe it's the radiated methane, so it's that organic gunk sort of there, and then it was alluded to in the press conference that you can sort of see that maybe it's, it's the thin layer, because, like, there's a crater, and it looks like there's been some excavation, so it's not very deep, so maybe that dark stuff is sort of Pluto's imprint, but, again, like, what's making that big sort of the, the canyons and stuff in the middle? Um, Meg, you studied the moon <laughs> a lot. You know, what do you see when you see this um, in terms of sort of seismic activity and, and sort of geologic features? Uh, it's, it's really interesting, and I really liked uh, that the discussion at the press conference today went to this place of, well, we're going to want to study a lot more about what we see in Sharon and from Pluto and Sharon's system in order to learn something about how the Earth and moon evolved. Um, to me, that's just such a poetically just thing <laughs> that we, we send a probe, um, you know, all the way out to study Pluto uh, in order to look back and discover something about our own uh, evolution of our own system. But, I mean, that aside, like, looking at this image, um, to me, so there's this huge, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but the big um, belt across the middle of the Sharon image to me looks like a tectonic feature. 
uh, which suggests like, that, like we said, the, the resolution isn't high enough to actually see if anything is flowing on the surface, but there are so many things that can be happening that don't involve actual flows of material. Um, like you said, the uh, vibration, so there's seismic shaking when something hits an object, the you know vicinity gets shaken up a little bit and material can move downhill and sort of fill in hollows, that kind of stuff. Uh, but then there's uh, also viscous relaxation, which we talked about a little bit yesterday, that we had some thoughts about concerning Pluto more than Sharon, because we thought Sharon would be a little bit more preserving of the cratering record of the two. Um, and then in Pluto's case, and again, this isn't applying to Sharon, there's the also the um, escape rates. So the like we were talking about yesterday, where the, we expected some material, we expected Pluto to be smoother than Sharon uh, because it would be having this resurfacing process that Sharon shouldn't have. But so the, the actual results that we're seeing today to me are very surprising because both bodies are missing a lot of craters. Um, especially that picture of Pluto that I'm, I'm sure we'll get to, but uh, this picture of Sharon is equally surprising to me that you can just see uh, as few craters as you do. Um, so, so to me, that's that's what I see when I look at it, and I think about you know it's my my own research background. It's on the moon, of course, and the moon looks very different than this, um, just very different. So I I don't know if I answered your question, but <laughs> that was my. Can I can I comment there a, a smidge? Um, yes, please. On on Pluto, if uh, as having stared at some of those uh, high res images, not the the ultra high res ones, but the ones from a couple of days ago. Um, just, you know, drawing boxes and counting craters or things that may actually be craters or maybe something else but at least round and trying right. to guess at what their sizes are. Um, there's a couple uh, papers come out recently to suggest what those uh, large cratering records should be based on the current measured size distribution and the current uh, dynamic state of the Kuiper Belt. Yeah, so you can see a whole bunch in this picture and the largest one yeah. Actually, the largest one is on the other side, but anyway, um, the largest being about 150 kilometers in size is about right for the current state of impact record, uh, or what you would expect for the impact record given the current dynamical state. Um, what to me is really strange is if you continue counting just you know from these uh, JPEGs, you run out of craters right quick. Uh, there are very few things smaller than something like 80 or 100 kilometers in size, and that is not what you would expect. Um, and I think that's where we need to start thinking about a strong resurfacing happening very frequently across the whole surface. And then, of course, those high-resolution images showing absolutely no craters whatsoever. That's cool. I think that's uh, probably the biggest result, to, or at least for me anyways, that has come out of... Uh, today's news. Exactly what size is erased exactly how quickly, I have no idea, but uh, it's pretty darn cool. The big things are still there, but the small things are absolutely absent. Craters, and, that is. And I mean, that's something we're going to get um, as the, you know, there's more data coming. This is, you know, a small portion of it, and it's not the highest resolution, right? This is the lowest compression, right? Because they need to get it out. Yeah. So there's <laughs> losslessly compressed, so it's like there's three stages, like, to make sure that, like, they get something. So they get this, I think, and then there's another low resolution. This is the high priority. And they get the rest of, I think, everything in low resolution. And then loss, everything will be sent, again, losslessly compressed, and that is the highest resolution. So these are, you know, <laughs> these are like the thumbnails. You enlarge, right? So there is better resolution coming. It's, you know, sort of delayed gratification. But they, everyone will be counting craters. Um, and I think it's crucial because we can't get the really small size solution from the Kuiper world. So, I mean, so seeing that, you know, what's going well, on we're not going to get it here either, unfortunately. I know, um, and that's going to be sort of the sad thing, and the only hope is that, at least with the large guys, at least we can try to tie it back to our observations and hopefully give us some ground truth of whether or not what we think we know for the size regions are right. Uh, um, in interestingly, uh, an argument can be made that there is some hope and that this is going to be an excellent selling point for an extended mission proposal from New Horizons, right? If it's, hey, look, this is a chance to get a, a cratering record on something that really gotta, gotta have craters. I mean, if, if you know, the random 30-kilometer Kuiper Belt object also looks like this, then, you know, we can start over, but... <laughs> well, so we are going to go to a second one, right? Or I shouldn't say we, I should say the New Horizons team is on their way to a cult yeah. classical right now. If, Much if, smaller but, thing, very uh, different theology. But they have to have... But, but that's not a done deal. 
So, so no, yeah, there's yeah. money in headquarters approval pending. If, uh, yeah. if they get an extended mission. We hope they get an extended mission. We really, really hope they get an extended mission. Hey, man, if just, Spitzer I, is still being funded, they're going to go to this second thing. Hey. There's never... There's never Sure, things are harder to come by than we might think. Uh, yeah, but, but, but like, this, this is the sort of thing that seems like it would only strengthen a proposal, which they are going to yeah. have to do, whether or not it's a sure thing, they have to generate a proposal. Yeah, I mean, basically what they, what they have to say is, you know, we really need to go to this Kuiper Belt object because Pluto and Charon were just so cool and so fascinating that they were useless for this other kind of science and we're just learning everything else, but we need to go to this other... We need to go to something more boring um, in order to, uh, you know, to do this part of the science case that we already wrote down. Like that's that's a great justification for more funding. I think that's that's going to be Does that awesome. work more boring? Give us money. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's like you know, the, we, they had a science case, right? And they're unable to fulfill the science case because they discovered something so amazing that they couldn't have thought of it, and so now they have to do something else to do the, you know, the science that was originally part of this thing, right? Well, I do think we need to sort of separate out the dwarf planets and the Pluto-sized object from where the, where the potential target is. The target is a cold classical object, and so it is a different size regime, and it might even form a different part of the solar system. So Pluto was carried when Neptune migrated, but cold classical, there's a lot of observational evidence now from the observers coming and saying that um, the cold classical belts, or the very circular objects on low, in, uh, low eccentricity orbits, um, might have formed in place, and so going to a cold classical is going to give us a very different view of sort of the Kuiper belt. So we might not get, we're going to get a different piece. I'm not sure, you know, it's going to get you exactly, it's going to give you, it'll give you different context, but I'm not sure it's going to, it'll frame maybe the Pluto observations, but I don't know if it's going to give you the same kind of, you're not going to the same kind of equivalent object, so maybe it's apples and oranges is what I would say. I'm yeah. really excited about it if it happens, because we've never, I mean, these are they're very different beasts, and we could go on for hours, I think, about that bit. But, I mean, I think there's still a lot to talk about, and we're almost out of time. So um, I want to ask, you know, um, Luke, maybe this is for both Luke and Amy. Um, we'll get to the Pluto um, yeah. in a second. But, you know, what could be causing this tidal, um, you know, is it tidal heating? Is it aluminum? Uh, radi you know, radiation? Uh, you know, aluminum-26? What might be causing this? Because if they're being resurfaced, there's got to be some kind of heat thing driving this, right? Driving this. Well, we, well first of all, we've got a wicked echo. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, you guys should have been here in our living room during the press conference because I was like SpongeBob in that episode where he's really upset and he rips himself in half. Um, you know, it's very difficult to imagine what source of energy could be doing this um, to these bodies. And so there were a couple things mentioned, like radiogenic heating, which is the decay of um, radioactive species in the rocky component of Pluto and Charon. There was also a suggestion that some of the um, gravitational potential energy that was liberated when these bodies formed had been stored somehow in the interior. So for example, maybe we could see this could be Pluto or Charon undergoing a very late differentiation, so a very late transition from that uh, chocolate chip ice cream state to the ball of rock in the center state. Okay, um, I mean, so earlier this year, Jeff Collins, who's at Wheaton College in Massachusetts, and I wrote a paper that came out in Icarus where we talked about the possibility of a brief period of activity on these two bodies after the um, Charon forming impact. And there's this funny thing about tidal heating, I'll, I'll try to explain, which is, at least this is how I think about it, um, is that if you have a body that's already a little bit warm and mushy, and it can kind of deform a little bit in response to um, a force you know, applied from another planet, okay, once that thing gets mushy and starts to deform a lot, the process kind of runs away. And so what we sort of suggested in the paper was that if Pluto was relatively warm before the impact and the precursor object a little bit warm as well, that after the impact happens when Charon is launched into an initially very high eccentricity orbit, you could actually dump a significant amount of energy into both bodies. So the sort of standard 
uh, model of that, which goes back to sometime in the mid-90s, suggests that there's not enough energy from that process to drive any kind of activity at all. But what's interesting is that as we've learned more about tides and how they uh, affect uh, the satellites of other planets, for example, Io, um, Enceladus, and Europa, every time we make one of those observations of another satellite, we find that the satellite is putting out like 10 to 100 times the amount of heat that's predicted by the models. So what Io, Enceladus, and Europa, and I think Pluto and Charon are telling us is that we don't really understand um, you know, how tides work inside icy bodies. That's what I think is going on. So that's my best guess. And when John Spencer said, you know, that he didn't think it was tidal heating, that's when I had my SpongeBob moment. I just, you know, I was like, what, what? Because I, I don't really agree with that statement. I mean, Amy, do you have some mechanism in mind to generate this heat, or is it just, I mean, it's it might be, so it's just we don't understand tides and we need to well, yeah. do what? Yeah, part, part of that is that um, the, the standard yeah, models the standard model. are, are relying on sort of viscous dissipation. So they're relying on, you know, the whole bulk interior of the satellite to kind of be stretched and squeezed. And it's like, you know, if you imagine taking a foam rubber ball and you're stretching and squeezing it, but it gets hotter as you stretch and, and squeeze. Um, and, you know, those types of models don't work. Those are the ones that I'm talking about that they, you know, they give you 10 to 100 times less heat than what we see. And so there are other suggestions that have been made, like, for example, Francis Nimmo has suggested that significant energy could be um, dissipated along ridges inside these bodies, so you have basically two sides of a cold, you know, ice crust that are rubbing back and forth against each other. I don't really think that that could work for Pluto and Charon because we don't see any of those ridges. Those ridges would show up like that X that we saw on Triton yesterday or a couple days ago. So um, I don't really know, and I think actually nobody knows. Um, and what I'm hoping is that this type of data will, um, will kickstart some new activity in lab experiments to try to understand this process a little bit better. Just to bring up that X, that's the, the Trident X that Amy's talking about. And I think it's a nice sort of um, segue into sort of the, the image none of us sort of expected. Um, if I can bring it up, which is the, the you know, the close-up of um, Pluto. Um, and if I'm seeing it, but it's not coming up. Let's see if I can grab it. Um, now, it's almost mountain picture. Yeah, here it goes. I, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> uh, um, Katie, you know, you're a, a cosmologist, and so you're sort of definitely um, coming at this from a different perspective. Was this like Barbie dragons? Like, was this what you were, when you think of like what we're going to see up close, was this anywhere near what you were expecting? I mean, I, I really had no idea. Um, I did not expect mountain ranges. I guess that that just did not see. I like, I, I mean, I, I expected, I guess, you know, a, a cratered, you know, rock. Um, I didn't, I didn't think there would be these big, weird, smooth patches and and um, you know, strange features that that you know, just look confusing. But I, I yeah, like. Massive a massive mountain range was not was not something that I thought I would see definitely. Right, and I think these are pretty big, right? Does anyone remember the size? These are something like Rockies ish. Yeah, Rocky yeah. Mountain so size. I was Rockies the one that tweeted about them being rocky, so like eleven thousand um, feet Eight. tall. And yeah. someone else did the calculations relative to the size of Pluto and came up with them being um, effectively similar to being two times the height of the Himalayas if you scale things by planet size. So, they're giant. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, in the, out, in the inner solar system, this would be rock. <laughs> this would be silicates, right? This would be... And so, um, Alan Sturm was saying that, again, like their analysis of, would be that this was... To stick up like this, it's got to be water ice. 
Um, so I think that's pretty. That was something I didn't quite sort of expect. I don't know about um, for you, Wes or Michelle. Was that sort of something that you were expecting or hearing that was was sort of blew your mind a bit? If you go back and read a post on Reddit from last week, I made a bet with some anonymous user that there would be a kilometer tall or multiple kilometer tall mountains on Pluto. <sighs> Nailed it. <laughs> um, it doesn't. It, it surprises me that they they make the statement that it's all uh, water ice. Um, to me, it, it would be unreasonable to think that they are entirely water ice and there's no uh, silicate component to them. But you know what? What do I know at this point? I, I was uh, really surprised to see so many of them. Uh, you know, seeing rubber duckies on comets and now mountains on Pluto. I really think we know very little about what's actually going on in the small bodies around us and. I think it's just a matter of waiting and seeing what they can show us next. So, so just to just to bust in, I, I see Michelle also is un, unmuted. At least sitting in the room, the impression I got from that discussion wasn't that there was no silicates, but was that it wasn't methane ice and it wasn't nitrogen yeah, ice. Okay, those good. are too yes. soft. Good. And it had to be water ice. I don't think there they was a comment on silicates. Good. I think it's also quite interesting looking at this image to see how the terrain changes very sharply. So you have those, you know, what immediately draws your eye is the sharp high relief mountain ranges with very steep sides. You can see as well, those are quite um, sharp ridge lines to them. But they rise, the, you know, the, if you think of your typical mountain range here on Earth or the Rockies, right? The Rockies are the famous things, but they have the, you know, the mountain ranges build up and up and up before you get to the Rockies. And it's only on one side that you really have quite a sharp edge. These things are rising out of relatively flat plains. And to me, that's fascinating. I, if I put on the speculation hat here, you know, you have this process where the atmosphere snows out uh, every orbital cycle as you go, as Pluto goes around the sun. Maybe what you're seeing is a mountain range, um, a mountain massif uh, of water ice with however much silicate underneath it. And the atmosphere is snowing layers and layers of snow down around that. So you're building up flat plains around it. But that's not overly consistent then with the more undulating, gentle terrain you have just to, uh, below, just south of, the, of these big sharp mountain ranges which has that really interesting kind of almost dimply pock mark in it, um, just at the lower center of the image, which has almost um, fracture-like cracking around it. And I wonder, um, Meg, what you might think of that regarding uh, cratering kind of look to it. Yeah, I, I mean, this might be a better question for Luke, but there's, you know, where the hell are the craters? <laughs> you kind of expected that you know, there, there would be some craters there. That you, I, I kind of expected you'd see a little bit sort of covered with the tholin, the organic gunk from irradiated methane, but that there would be something. And then again, there's a pretty smooth area, and there's nada. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I haven't... Obviously, the team hasn't had time to count uh, any yet. Uh, as, as Wes pointed out, the biggest crater we, we saw seems to be about what we predicted and what Sarah Greenstreet and Brett Gladman and Bill McKinnon predicted. So Good work. It, um, <laughs> um, I mean, it could be like, you know, like Titan has a really big crater uh, on it, you know, like 450 kilometers or something. So for that particular size, it's an old surface, but for much smaller craters, it's a young surface. So I think you're just going to have to wait to see what the counts really are before we say anything about how old these surfaces are. One of the things that I, I didn't quite nestle enough, I agree with the sort of team's assessment. And again, this is all like they saw these a few hours before everybody else, and they're doing the same thing we're doing now, maybe with a little bit more informed perspective on at least the data quality and, and stuff. Um, but, you know, there was argument that this is clearly majority was water ice, and therefore that there's less volatiles than they kind of expected, and there's the atmosphere is escaping, that that indicates some kind of internal activity and then potentially outgassing of volatiles. Is that, I mean, do we all believe that? I mean, there was, there was suggestion of, I guess I, I heard in the press conference cryovolcanoes, but then I never really saw any 
maybe it was to, uh, suggested as one of the ways that you could be getting sort of the volatiles out to the surface. I don't know if anyone else had a better sort of understanding and wants to take a, take a sort of swing at this. Um, but it was sort of looking at these mountains and sort of suggesting that, you know, this is one of the reasons, not only because, you know, the plains are so smooth and less craters, but needing these volatiles and they're not being as sort of, that they're very thinly layered onto the surface, as it appears, requires, you know, getting volatiles out from the interior. I, I would agree that mountain ranges, like we see in this picture, are suggestive of processes that are reminiscent of volcanoes. But I would also state that we know so very little about uh, even the process of material leaving the center of Io, which is a, a seemingly a much better studied body at this point. I don't think we know anything about how the material on the surface has got there, how it's been resurfaced, or anything like that at this point. I think it's just such a, an alien material, uh, alien surface compared to what we would have uh, seen. I think it probably breaks just about every model you could throw at it at this point, but that's just my thought. Right. And I think one of the things that maybe is coming out of this is that, you know, there is no good maybe analog now for Pluto and Charon. It definitely doesn't look like Trident, which used to be this is the Pluto analog. Um, so it they seem very, very different. Um, and, you know, the argument is, is that there is no, we talked about tides, there's no giant planet around to power tides the way we see on the other icy satellites in, in the, you know, middle solar system that, an outer solar system that sort of could be a way out for whenever we see active surfaces is that, you know, if you're close to Jupiter and you're having your, in, you know, the planets inside, the, the moon's insides are being sort of turned up, allowing sort of, um, you know, sort of geologic activity and, you know, outgassing and other kinds of resurfacing, these guys don't have that, so we can't call that mechanism. We might be able to call the tidal interaction between Pluto and Charon, but that is different than maybe what, or at least on a different scale than what we're seeing elsewhere in the solar system. Is that a fair assessment to say, Kevin? I don't know. <laughs> this is tough. Sorry, Meg. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll take it. it. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, I. I mean, I think that I think that's fair. And um, you know, I mean, these bodies are very small. You know, Pluto is really small. It's smaller than Earth's moon. Um, you know, the impact between them that formed. Uh, Charon had to have been a relatively gentle impact, otherwise Charon wouldn't be around in the system anymore. And so it does raise the question, like, if you have, you know, X amount of energy available in the system over its whole lifespan, how did we suddenly manage to concentrate it in this one narrow window of time to drive some kind of resurfacing? So either there's more energy available or the dissipation processes are much more efficient than we, than we thought before. But, you know, this is a stretch. I mean, the comment that we've broken every model available is, is very, very true. This is going to cause a major rethinking, um, you know, for icy satellite interiors and, and even the origin of Charon, I think. And lots more data to come. So I think, you know, it's probably time to wrap up, but maybe I can get each one of everybody sort of passing sort of final thoughts about sort of the data we've got and the data that's going to be coming in. So Did maybe I'll... Just... Yeah, go go ahead. So can I just ask a really, really quick, um, dumb question? Um, do reasonable people disagree about the pronunciation of Karen, Sharon, the 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 thing that isn't Pluto, or or is that I, I've been saying Sharon? Um, Amy says Karen. I don't I don't know. Meg, um, Meg, that's all. Okay. Yeah. History aside, go for it. Uh, well, actually, I mean, I, I always said Sharon, and I'm only recently, like, understanding the reasons why Karen is a possibility, but I did understand from the press press briefings yesterday that the discoverer of Sharon pronounces it Sharon, or something like that, so, uh, so I'm going to go with whatever he says and maybe complain about, I mean, like, I don't know, the <laughs> naming conventions... Oh, there's just so much <laughs> we so, could talk about there's just a that. Story. There's a story behind it. So maybe Michelle yeah, started it. Yeah, please. So Karen, Karen is the Greek one, which yeah. is the ferryman. Uh, of, the ferryman of the dead is the IAU term. But the uh, um, discoverer's wife, her name starts with Sharon, 
So if you say it more with, you know, more like Sha, then he said, I'll pronounce it this way because it's a nod to her. So it's kind of a shibboleth, actually. It's a little in-joke amongst uh, planetary astronomers has always been to pronounce it Sha on rather than Ka, ka on with the hard K. So you can pronounce it either way. There is no correct pronunciation in that sense, Just, but it's a nice nod. To Go for it. <laughs> And I think the other history with that is the same thing with Eris. The moon is Dysonomia, and D is for, in honor of Mike Brown's wife, Diane, a sort of a nod to this Sharon, Pluto Sharon sort of nod as well. Um, so it's a nice little bit of sort of mirroring between Eris and Pluto in terms of naming um, their satellites. Um, so while we finish with the history, why don't we, we sort of talk a little bit about, just to summarize everybody's thoughts, final thoughts about the... Uh, what we saw today. So why don't we start with you, Wes, and, and go down the line. Uh, they, it seems they very cleverly selected a small data set of their uh, spectra to, to maybe even mask some things, but that continuum spectrum, the red line in that one plot they showed looks an awful lot, at, at least at two microns, looks an awful lot like the shape of a pyrocene or something along the lines of a pyrocene and I would be very intrigued to see what the rest of that spectrum looks like. I've already bet a bottle of scotch on uh, Twitter today that that is actually going to turn out to be a pyrocene or something like it. So Michelle, why don't, yes, why don't, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll throw out the plot, but Michelle, why don't you give your passing thoughts? I think you're muted. And I'm honestly feeling so excited and so exhausted emotionally at the same time, <laughs> seeing all of this. It's kind of my brain is uh, um, going, you know, 20 million to the second going, okay, look, surface feature. What about this mountain? What about the flat plain? What about the fact there doesn't seem to be much in the way of slope run out or, you know, quasi-glacial features or any kind of erosional things that you think of coming off that mountain? But the, surf but the surface morphology is so varied. My brain just to, um, spinning on the geomorphology that we see and trying to compare it to things that are familiar and yet knowing that those are going to be absolutely wrong in this uh, <laughs> environment. What about you, Meg? Um, yeah, just exactly what Michelle just said about uh, analogies is what where my brain is going these days. I mean, just from the press briefing, everybody admitting that we have... Uh, the analogies don't work anymore. You know, we, we use the Earth to, to reason to the Moon and to Mars. We use Mars now to reason to Pluto. And, of course, that's not there. The reason an analogy works is because there are some things that are similar and some things that are not. And in order to be useful, you have to decide where that boundary is. Uh, and we're at the point now where people are um, saying publicly, we're having this, a little bit of a public discussion about what happens when you have to leave your analogies behind. And that's just super interesting to me, and I just want to know where people are going to go with it, uh, because this is, this is a major research strategy. It's just a major reasoning strategy for planetary science. It always has been, and uh, I'm just really curious how it's going to play out, and I'm uh, thankful that we are seeing these kinds of public discussions that we have access to hearing people's thoughts like everybody here, so I'm really just happy to talk to all of you um, and to get everyone's perspective on it in such a such a great public conversation way. So I'm excited to see more. <laughs> yeah, and I guess that's worth the point. If we were all in the same place, we'd be doing basically the same thing, looking at the pictures, doing the justice. Um, what about you, Luke? Sorry. <laughs> um, I actually wanted to ask a question. Um, after having seen this, does this make you all think, like if, say you had money for another New Horizons, would you go to, you know, Maki Maki or something? Would you want to see Triton again? What would you, what would you do? I mean, this is just so unlike anything we've seen before that it's, I mean, I'm really hoping this will spur interest in the outer solar system, which has been, as you all know, sadly lacking in missions for a long time, but I'm really curious how this is going to drive things. So Maybe we should just raise our like hands. If you want to go to Maki Maki, yeah, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, that wasn't that many. <laughs> Somewhere else. 
there's a few somewhere else's, and everyone else is like, ah. <laughs> all right, the somewhere else is quickly. Where would you guys want to go? Marcus. Eris. Uh, I think Haumea Eris. is the one. I think Haumea is the one that's actually reachable in a rational amount of time, and I think there's a lot to be said for it. Uh, and I, I, I go for the good old solar system, so I go for the Trojans just to compare now. I, I as a as a theoretical cosmologist, I have no obligation to be rational, so I'm I'm gonna go with Eris <laughs> as well. Muted, Meg. Just to give some scale, right? Eris is out roughly at 100 AU. It took what 10 years to get to Pluto, so we're young. We're young. <laughs> yeah, but it's not going to get tired. Yeah, yeah, then we could do it on the way, right? So, uh, yeah. We would uh, just be ending our careers by the time that Eris got there, um, just to give some scale on that. Kevin, what about you in terms of your final? Uh, pretty confused, like uh, everybody. I'm really excited to see these high resolution images of the smaller satellites, and as they start to release those high resolution, high resolution images of Pluto. We just saw a little bit of that boundary between the heart and the rest of the surface. And as the rest of those come out, we're going to see what that boundary looks like, to see what that diversity is right there. Uh, this is going to be super fun. What about you, Katie? Um, I'm, I'm just, my, my mind is blown every five minutes um, by this whole thing, and I... I mean, I've I've learned a huge amount just just talking to you guys in the last hour, and thank you so much. Um, but like, yeah, I've, I'm I'm actually it's it's kind of neat. It's a it's a great sort of crash course on geology of of solar system objects because uh, just by everybody talking about you know this shouldn't happen because this is how it usually goes, I'm actually learning a lot about um, you know other stuff in the solar system too. So it's it's Awesome. Great. What about you, Erin? Um, I'm looking forward to seeing more of the data, um, just to see what the distribution of mountains really are. And also in the mountain images, I don't think anyone's brought it up, but I've been kind of squinting at it, because it looks like there's dunes. You see, like, little ripples off to the left. And so I'm kind of interested to see, like, how the little dune fields versus mountains, um, you know, seem to relate to each other. That's going to be interesting when more data comes down. Remember the scale on that. If those are dunes, they're going to be... They're big, yeah. <laughs> they're probably the biggest in the solar system. Dunes, yeah. would be, dunes would be crazy. Dunes would be amazing. What about you, Andy? Muted. All right, got it. I knew I was muted. I, I just couldn't find the button. Um, I guess I have two thoughts. Uh, first, um, you know... Every object in the solar system that we've visited has turned out to be much more complicated than we thought. And there's clearly a lot going on. And, you know, like, like Amy and I were saying when we were coming up with our, our new term for planets, um, you know, even down to things that are a couple hundred meters across are turning out to be, you know, you think it's a couple hundred meters across. How complicated can this be? It's complicated. Pluto, you know, it shouldn't surprise us that there's this, all this crazy stuff going on. Um, and I'm I'm just a simple country astronomer, so I don't know how to how to talk about the geology necessarily. Um, uh, the other the other thought is just how um, amazing it's been to uh, to be lucky enough to be at APL for this, um, and also to kind of have everyone share in it uh, in a way that was not possible for you know I sat at home and watched the one hour PBS special when Voyager passed Saturn. You know, and um, that, as as Meg said, you know, getting to have, getting to share this with so many people inside and outside of the scientific community has been uh, just tremendous. And uh, I hope it's not a once in a once in a lifetime event, but uh, certainly it's. I don't think something that's ever happened before. Very, very true. And what about you, Amy? Well, I think like everybody else, I, I've been kind of a nervous wreck all day. Um, you know, waiting for the pictures to come back, wondering why Alan's jaw was dropping when he was looking at the laptop, and, um, you know, just huge surprise at uh, the fact that 
you know, it looks like Charon has been active. I think that's something that, you know, many of us may have hoped for. And, you know, the fact that it looks like it's happened is, is just really surprising. And uh, I think this is going to, you know, provide a lot of really good material for people to, um, you know, think about how tides and impacts affect solid bodies. You know, it, we're, I think we're, hopefully, this is the beginning of a renaissance. That's my hope. Yeah, I guess for me in some way, I mean, we've talked about, you know, Pluto's gone from a point of light to, a, a, you know, a, a world we can sort of see and explore in, up close and becoming now something where, you know, the geologists and surface people get to, get to play with this data set. Um, you know, I think for me, like, coming from the point of my thesis was looking for these objects, one's one smaller, one's some bigger, um, you know, than others. That this, you know, seeing that difference where usually I'm looking at a moving blob that moves in the, you know, the image to seeing it sort of be morph into this thing, this interesting world has been sort of interesting. And I, I, I think maybe, I think anyone who works in planetary science and maybe all of science is, this is why we do this, right? I think this is every time these kind of missions and these, you know, first experiences, this is what reminds me of being 12 and being, you know, watching, you know, the, the, Pathfinder people, fl you know, flipping out when the thing landed and started taking images, you know, and I, I think that's the thing that keeps you were kind of coming twelve. Back. I don't remember how old I was. Oh God, I don't. I, yeah. <laughs> I was in seventh grade, whatever that was. Yeah, but you know, like that that bit still there. Um, and so it was fun to sort of see it come out again. Um, and I guess the other thing is that we're, you know, who's gonna be the? It's gonna be our peers, my peers, us. Someone's going to be the PI of the next one of these, hopefully, you know, missions to this part of the realm. Um, you know, I think there was talk of, of sort of discovery, you know, ending an error, but I don't. I think an, I think rather an error has begun, um, and I hope we do come back, whether it's Trident or somewhere else. And so maybe it's going to be one of the people here is going to be PIing that. So um, who knows? So I think that's kind of fun to think about. So I guess with that, we've taken more time than I wanted to, but I want to thank you all. Um, you guys have been amazing. Many of you have done two night, two days of this. So thank you for taking your time and coming out to sort of uh, be the PR uh, gallery for exploring these images. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thanks thank to everyone else. Yeah. Thanks, Meg. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.